Thank you so much, ma'am. And at the outset, I would like to thank the organizers of this uh, wonderful conference, uh, Dr. Rundul, Dr. Bansi Sabuji, and Dr. Narmendra, uh, for having me here and giving me this opportunity to speak on this topic. So my topic for today is uh, the role of plant-based diets before pregnancy. Uh, so, um, you know, we all understand that preconceptual nutrition is something that is very, very important. It's a vital part of preparing for the pregnancy because what happens is whatever pre-pregnancy nutrition or the health of the woman will affect not only her fertility if she's trying to get pregnant, the pregnancy complications and the maternal and child health, not only during pregnancy, but it affects them both the mother and the child throughout life. For example, if a woman's weight it depends upon her starting weight and pregnancy and that will ultimately have an impact on the birth weight of the child and also the future weight of the child in terms of obesity and even uh, the development of type 2 diabetes for the child and for herself. Then if she does not consume a well-balanced diet, for example, we know that folic acid is something that is so important for the growth of the child for preventing neural tube defects in the child. And uh, usually uh, what um, you know, my research uh, has shown is that the first 28 days after conception is the period when folic acid is really required in large amounts by the woman. And most of the time, you know, uh, all those who have our mothers here would know that the first 28 days, many a times you don't even realize that you are uh, uh, pregnant, you know. And so you missed out on those 28 days. So if you had a good status of folic acid consumption prior to pregnancy, then this 28 days would have been taken care of. So prior to pregnancy, whatever you are eating is having an impact on whatever, you know, you need during the initial days of pregnancy and also later. Another example is low iron stores. Now we know that many, many women start their pregnancy with very low iron stores and it could be because of uh, menstrual losses that they go through every month along with a diet which is not very rich in iron, which doesn't have iron rich foods. So they start their pregnancy with a low iron status. And we know that a pregnant woman's blood volume increases massively and because of which her iron requirement is so high. So all these things, supposing all this was all sorted before she became pregnant, wouldn't it be much better and wouldn't the pregnancy be much easier? There would be no nutritional deficiencies and things would be far more on track. So let's come to an understanding of what is a plant-based diet. Now plant-based diet is really not a diet, but it's a way of life or it's a lifestyle change that people make. And we see that it's becoming very popular. And what does it really mean? It means that you are actually filling up your plate with a lot more plant-based foods and which would be vegetables, fruits, legumes, whole grains, nuts, seeds. Okay, and the popularity of these plant-based diets is increasing, one, because of the health concerns. We have a lot of uh, international organizations like the uh, American Diabetes Association, which is actually recommending a plant-based diet for managing type 2 diabetes. So we have organizations like that who are talking about the positive aspects of plant-based diets. So it could be because of health concerns, we have uh, environmental reasons, sustainability, and for some people it is uh, animal welfare, not wanting to touch any animal-based foods. So there could be, the choice could be because of any one of these uh, reasons. Now let's see what are the, there's a whole variety. When we talk of plant-based eating, uh, there's a whole variety there. So you have uh, semi-vegetarian or flexitarian people, they would be okay eating eggs and dairy and maybe small amounts of meat, poultry, fish and seafood. You have the pescatarians which are okay, they are okay eating eggs, dairy, fish and seafood but no other meat and poultry. Over vegetarians would be, they would eat all vegetarian products but they are okay eating eggs, no dairy, no fish, seafood, none of that. Lacto-vegetarians would eat, which I think most people here are lacto-vegetarians, they are okay having dairy, but no eggs, fish, meat, poultry. Lacto-over-vegetarian, which I am, I'm okay having dairy, I'm okay having egg, 
but I'm not okay having any of the other non-veg products. Then we have vegans who will not have anything related to animal foods. So you have a whole lot of people who would choose plant-based uh, diets but very different formats in which they would have made these choices. So if you look for the healthiest diets, if you do a search online and look for healthiest diets, what always pops up is the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet. And we are aware of this, that these will pop up as the best two diets. There are others, you know, the Asian diets are there. There are many others, but these two will always feature in the healthiest diets. So, which is this? These are the diets. Actually, Mediterranean diet is a culturally uh, uh, inspired diet. It is people from Syria, Turkey, all the people who live around the Mediterranean Sea, they are the ones who have this Mediterranean diet and we've seen that they have a lot of plant-based foods in their diet and some amount of lean meat and fish. The DASH diet is again a lot of plant foods, there may be lean meats and nuts, but there is an added requirement that is the adherence to the sodium guidelines because this is focused only towards reducing hypertension. Right? So there are other micronutrients also, there would be calcium, magnesium, potassium, which would also uh, be in higher quantities here or the focus will be there so that hypertension is managed well. Now, the Mediterranean diet, interestingly, was given the UNESCO status. It was awarded this UNESCO status of being the intangible cultural heritage of humanity. Now, this is an interesting status that it achieved, but this just shows that it's a cultural way of eating. It is not a diet separately. Dash may be a diet separately, but this is definitely a cultural style of eating. Now, what do we see in this um, uh, Mediterranean diet? What are the uh, features of this diet? One is it will always have whole grain cereals. We will not see any refined cereals in this uh, diet. And what is the uh, you know, the advantage we get out of it, it gives us fiber, it gives us a lot of micronutrients. Now, if you know, you look at this diet and think of our Indian diet, you will find a lot of similarity in many ways between the Mediterranean and the uh, Indian diet. Then you look at vegetables, they have a whole lot of vegetables, different colored vegetables, rich colored vegetables, and that gives them a lot of antioxidants and it has a lot of protective factors for uh, diabetes and that is why like I said the American Diabetes Association actually recommends this uh, diet. There's lots of fruit that is there. It's almost eaten like with every meal and this is so good because it satisfies the sweet cravings and it's also a great source of antioxidants. Dairy products are there in their diet and uh, this could be a source of saturated fats. We need some amount. We'll talk about that later and there is a lot of calcium also which helps to protect the bones. Then uh, as part of the dairy products, there are a lot of fermented dairy products which are also eaten and fermented products are giving us the probiotics which are again uh, protective in their own way. Olive oil is their main medium of cooking and we know that olive oil has uh, very good uh, cardiovascular protective properties in maintaining blood lipids and uh, preventing atherosclerosis. They do not have a lot of stress on salt in the diet. Of course, they use whatever is required. But they, has a, they have a lot of herbs and spices. I think everybody is familiar. There's a lot of Mediterranean food that is being served and uh, we enjoy eating it. So we know how uh, the herbs are being used, garlic, onion. Uh, there are nuts in it. There are seeds in it. So uh, we have a lot of um, variety in this and a lot of little, little medicinal uh, you know, properties, little antioxidant properties, good fiber. All that is like a hallmark of this diet. Fermented foods, like I said, uh, you know, if you go to Turkey, you get a drink called kefir. Kefir is a, a probiotic beverage. Then they have Greek yogurt, regular yogurt. Uh, they may have flavored yogurts, but we are talking about the uh, basic unflavored versions also. Animal food is there, but it is not like it has to be there in every meal like the Western diet. Okay, so this is uh, more you'll have, you know, maybe two twice a week, thrice a week. Egg is there three to four times in a week. So uh, weekly you will have, you know, few portions of only the healthy lean meats. Fish is there in a large way. They eat a lot of fish, uh, mostly fish and, uh, you know, the omega-3s that we can get from certain kinds of fish. So this gives us the amino acids and the healthy fats also 
from a lot of these uh, foods. Sugary foods are not part of their diet. It's a very occasional treat that they have, uh, you know, sweets and uh, it is nothing that uh, you don't see it as part of a regular uh, Mediterranean diet. So if you uh, check, you know, what are the health benefits of the Mediterranean diet or the DASH diet? These are the primarily, uh, you know, vegetable and fruit based diets, the whole grain diets. So they have you know, we have evidence to show that there is lower obesity, decreased BMI, lower visceral fat and improved insulin resistance as a result of this diet. It is cardioprotective. In fact, uh, you know, the Lifestyle Heart Trial, which did a very interesting uh, trial where it, uh, they saw the, compared the omnivorous diets, which are, uh, you know, also to uh, the, these omnivorous diets or the American Heart Association recommended standard of care diet was uh, taken and it was compared with the plant-based diet and interestingly the plant-based diet had better reduction 34 percent more patients on the uh, plant-based diet had less atherosclerosis uh, development so even as compared to the aha diet it has been recommended standard of care plant-based diets have been shown to be positive now um, another study was done where uh, patients with high blood pressure uh, it was seen, you know, whether they develop type 2 diabetes when they are given different kinds of diets. This included the Mediterranean diet, DASH diet, vegan diet. Here the vegan diet showed the maximum decrease in the diastolic and the systolic blood pressure levels. So uh, we see, you know, even a vegan diet coming up very beautifully in these. So, uh, you know, the uh, ADA standards of medical care in diabetes, it recognizes that a plant-based diet is a viable option for people with type 2 diabetes and they have shown a inverse relationship between vegan and development of type 2 diabetes. So we have a lot of these studies which are, you know, I've got a whole lot of studies here which have shown the benefit of plant-based diets. There's one very interesting study which was a 10 year long uh, case cohort study of over 300,000 uh, individuals and they showed that individuals who ate more plants more fruits and vegetables, they had higher plasma levels of vitamin C, which is literally like a marker for understanding that these people have eaten more of plant-based foods. Where do we get vitamin C from? It's from plants and uh, fruits and vegetables, right? So this is an e easy, simple to do strategy and uh, to prevent type 2 diabetes. Now let's come to the preconception diet. Now, what are we really concerned about when we come to the preconception diet? The first is what is the impact that this diet is going to have on fertility? Many, many women, we see infertility going up very, at, it's at phenomenal rates today. And the impact on fertility is there. Then you could have complications during pregnancy, outcome of pregnancy and the long-term uh, effects on the mother and child. These are all concerns for us when we are talking about a preconception diet. So uh, when you look at the diet and lifestyle, now we can't keep lifestyle away from diet. It has to be together. So the first thing that we have to look at is weight. We have heard all the previous speakers and how weight, uh, the whole story begins with, you know, weight. So uh, uh, managing weight and what effect it has on uh, different aspects of pregnancy. The first is that, uh, you know, the weight status of the person depends upon maybe lifestyle because lifestyle is a physical activity and the diet of the uh, woman and the family history or the genetics that the person, imagine this uh, uh, woman whose mother had uh, gestational diabetes. We know that that predisposes her to <coughs> obesity. Maybe she has come with those genetics, with those genes. So we don't know, it's a terrible cycle which is affecting the entire uh, population. So uh, fertility gets affected and there is always, we've seen from different studies that a healthy weight is absolutely necessary for managing natural conception or even for assisted reproductive treatment, weight becomes a very important part of the whole process. So we know that insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia are all these are the key features of metabolic syndrome and PCOS and which we know will have an effect on the ovulation and female fertility. So weight is becoming one of the most important uh, features. 
Next, if we look at, uh, you know, obviously ovulation depends upon estrogen production. Where does estrogen come from? Estrogen is made either in the ovaries or in the fat cells. Mm -hmm. Excess fat cells will lead to e excess estrogen production. If there are less fat cells, that means less estrogen production. So basically, the entire scenario is changing if the woman has adiposity and that can change her levels of fertility. Now if we come to the male, I mean we talk of the female but look at the male that there are studies which show that a high BMI, a man with a high BMI that will have an effect on the sperm quality and quantity. So that's also part of fertility. It's not only the woman who is uh, affected. Right? Now, once uh, she does get pregnant, then overweight and obesity are associated with a lot of uh, uh, terrible outcomes like it could be uh, miscarriage, preterm delivery, C-sections, excess gestational weight, it could be preeclampsia, gestational uh, diabetes and urinary incontinence. All these are conditions that, can, uh, that she can suffer from. Now, when it comes to the baby, the baby also has uh, suffers a lot. It could be stillborn, have a birth defect may weigh more than 4.5 kgs at birth, that is macrosomia, have a large fetal circumference and be increased at future childhood and adult obesity and associated problems. So it doesn't end at only the woman and her diet, it has a huge chain reaction. Okay, so now when we are looking at the diet preconception and what is its effect on fertility, look at, let's look at the evidence. It's only the evidence which is going to give us the answers. Right, so here, uh, you know, this study was done and it showed that uh, an adherence to the Mediterranean diet had the best and strongest and most consistent association with in, uh, improved clinical pregnancy rates. And, uh, you know, somebody who was uh, consuming uh, less of trans fatty acids and had a discretionary food intake, means less of fast foods, less of sugar sweetened beverages had a better outcome when it came to natural uh, conception or even in the assisted reproductive treatment. So here again we are seeing Mediterranean diet or a plant-based diet having a good effect. Now uh, we see from another study that uh, folic acid like I mentioned is very important for the conception and during just after conception. And uh, this study showed, uh, these were from the Harvard Medical School, this study showed that supplemental folic acid before the pregnancy and at levels which were higher than what is normally prescribed after conception showed that there were much better, it had a much better outcome on fertility and uh, the treatment, uh, infertility treatment also had more positive results. So that then antioxidant supplementation of the male partner seemed to have better results when it came to fertility. Omega-3 fatty acids have shown to have very good results with fertility. Adherence to Mediterranean diet again in this study showed that it had better uh, fertility in women and better semen quality in men. So what are the components that we have in the Mediterranean diet which are helping with fertility? One is the antioxidants. We have seen beta carotene, vitamin C, vitamin E. And all these are, uh, there. some of them have got to do with the progesterone that is needed to sustain pregnancy. Some of them are because of the ovulation uh, support, decreased inflammation and decrease in the endometriosis inflammation that we usually see. And we can see the sources of foods and these are all plant-based foods that we are seeing which are providing these uh, antioxidants. Folic acid, we've already discussed. Zinc, we've seen that zinc also, which comes a lot. It has Zinc is there in a lot of animal foods, but we have some excellent uh, plant sources of zinc um, also. And uh, then selenium, selenium again, uh, you know, just like I, I always tell diabetics, like you need selenium, you, uh, I tell hypothyroid uh, patients, you know, you need selenium, one Brazil nut can give you your daily requirement of selenium. So it's easy to do, it's not difficult, it's just that that awareness has to be there, the knowledge has to be there that this will help. Then uh, healthy fats, like we said, it's anti-inflammatory and it promotes ovulation. Olive oil in the Mediterranean diet is one of the healthiest fats along with the nuts. Whole grains, it helps with insulin resistance and oxidative stress and dairy. Dairy is, it features here. So dairy is something that a lot of uh, people think that dairy may not be the right um, you know, food to include. But here we are seeing good results with dairy and whole fat dairy. Okay. 
Okay, now then, uh, you know, most of us focus on the protein. Now the source of protein also becomes important. If we normally only count, okay, total protein, this is the requirement, we must meet the total requirement of protein. But where does this protein come from? Now this study showed that the ovulatory disorders was reduced by five by 50 percent when only five percent of the total calories was composed of plant-derived proteins. So just shifting the so I'm not saying give up completely on the animal protein, but add more or replace some of the animal protein with plant protein. So just such a huge magnified difference with such a small amount of protein that was given from plant sources. Now here eggs seem to have a different place in the entire uh, fertility uh, diet, right? Because we know that uh, the entire uh, steroid based hormones, all these hormones that you can see all our testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, all are steroid based hormones and which need cholesterol to as the building blocks for the hormones. So it was seen that, you know, eggs seem to support this that even if somebody is, uh, you know, um, uh, wants to give up animal protein, wants to shift to a plant-based diet, if there is a fertility concern, some amount of egg consumption may help. Um, that's a choice. And then eggs are also a good source of choline, a neutral a nutrient that helps prevent birth defects, and it also helps in infant brain function. So that was to do with fertility. Let's see what happens with the complications of diabetes. Now, uh, pre-pregnancy health, it's a window of opportunity. We just heard the previous speakers talking about the window of opportunity. This is a window of opportunity to have the best possible uh, nutrition for the lady who's going to become pregnant. We see a lot of young girls here, young women. So I think these are good takeaways for uh, many of you. And uh, the nutritional status of pregnancy is associated with the maternal and child outcomes. So there was this study which was, uh, you know, it was a study done in uh, different countries and high income countries and uh, upper middle income countries, lower middle income and lower income countries. And what was seen was that in the childbearing age, women had a very high intake of refined sugar, high fat and low intake of fruits, vegetables and plant sources of uh, plant sources of food. Now, along with that, it was seen that in the high income countries, uh, young women of childbearing age had low levels of iodine, iron and folate, which are so very important for pregnancy. That means it raises a concern about the nutritional preparedness of these women for pregnancy. So I think a lot of education is required as a, I mean, you know, this whole beverage culture today is crazy. Meeting over a coffee is the done thing and what kind of beverages, you know, they are all sugar laden beverages. I don't know of any beverage which is not, doesn't have sugar. Nobody wants to have the buttermilk and the coconut water and the regular old stuff, right? So uh, this is something that is uh, common. Now let's see gestational diabetes, which is one of the, we've been talking about it and we are focusing it on that. And which is one of the, uh, you know, globally we see one in six live births. Uh, there's a presence of gestational diabetes in the mothers, okay? And it's a vicious cycle of intergenerational cycle of obesity and diabetes. It doesn't only affect the mother and the child, it also affects the entire population as a whole. Okay, now what are the risk factors? There's obesity, overweight, westernized diet, micronutrient deficiencies, advanced maternal age and family history of insulin resistance and or diabetes. Now let's see what are the things one can do for this gestational diabetes. So one is if we look at the lifestyle modifications that can help. Now there was a study which showed that if women were physically active prior to pregnancy, they had a 29% lower risk of GDI. If they followed a low carbohydrate and low sugar diet, they had a 14% lower risk. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, it's your okay. time is over. Over? Yeah. I got lost. <laughs> I'll, I'll take, can I take three minutes? I just get so involved that I forget. I'm so sorry. I'll, I'll rush through it. Now. I'll come to the final thing. Okay. So women who have a higher diet quality, store, uh, I mean, the quality of their diet is good, they have a 28% lower risk. So we've got a whole lot of studies which show about the plant-based diets and how they have supported 
uh, uh, you know, the prevention of uh, diabetes or gestational diabetes. We've got, you know, what all can the different um, uh, diets do and where all the benefits are there. So we've seen all this. This is the mechanism. What are the different uh, areas from the Mediterranean diet, plant-based diets that can be of help? Okay. So I want to come to basically, um, you know, one thing I want to mention here is that diet diversity. This is a study that was done in Bangalore and it showed that, okay, all the plant-based diets, etc., whatever we are talking about, there was some consumption of eggs and there was some fast food and there was some fried food. Everything was there and still there was lower gestational diabetes over there. So the reason was that there was a lot of diet diversity and they had a lot of different kinds of foods which were protecting them. So if a person is only focusing on fast foods and not the best quality, they had good quality and along with that they enjoyed their fast foods and their other fried foods also. Yeah, yeah. Now gut health is something that we have heard even in the previous uh, uh, you know, uh, talks that gut health has a huge impact. Now um, I want to talk about this, is plant based always healthy? We imagine that, oh, it's plant-based, so it's healthy. So sh studies have shown that, you know, when people move, we only focus on the protein. And then when we are using novel plant-based products, a lot of no novel plant-based, look at this impossible burger, which is one of the most popular things in the US. You know, they uh, so it looks and tastes like a burger, but actually it's a plant uh, meat. So when people move from these regular whole plant foods to products like this, there is a chance still that their micronutrient, they'll be micronutrient deficient and be having excess fat, sodium and sugar. So it's not like plant-based is always healthy. There are pitfalls of a plant-based diet. We just have to choose correctly and be sure that we are eating the right kind of plant foods. So my takeaway for this would be pregnancy is a window of opportunity. A good lifestyle and diet is definitely a protective factor. Uh, but we have to choose correctly. We are not saying by any standards that give up your completely give up your animal foods. But make sure there's a lot of plant based foods in the plate. Maybe two third of the plate is plant based and just one third of the plate could be lean sources of animal foods. And adequate protein, again, like we saw, it has to be from the right kind of uh, source. And uh, make sure that it's not an incorrectly planned plant uh, based diet. Focus on vitamin D, B12 and omega 3 which are usually lacking in a vegan kind of a diet. So along with plant foods, all remove processed foods and have a lot of diver uh, diversity in the diet. And I think uh, women are protected. Thank you. And sorry for overshooting.